Well, it's a reaction of sorts, isn't it? We're, we're reacting to some, some glorious news today. Um, let's get the elephant out of the room right away. Me and Stevie clearly <laughs> didn't communicate what we were wearing because we're both wearing pretty much the exact same top. Not for the first time, may I add, Stevie? It's not. What can I say? I'm a trendsetter, Hamish, and I'm not surprised whatsoever that you have decided to follow in my fashion footsteps, but it's all right. I'm used to this. John, just confirm that you're not wearing the same top, please. You're, you're no, sound. I'm not. I'm, no, I'm all, I'm all good. I've got a hoodie on. How's things, lads? How how we, how we feeling? Hogmanay's here. Celtic have just somehow announced a, a triple January signing, and it's not even January. I'm surprised you never opened with Kenichiwa, Hamish. I'm surprised mm. you haven't been looking up how to pronounce it. I've got That's our names down the bottom. Doing. Got our names, yeah. I hope that doesn't say anything <laughs> about me. I hope that is my name. Yeah. It's actually it's actually John without the H for some reason because that's I've, I've properly looked into this. That's G O N, I believe yours. Um, Stevie's is something different as well. Of um, course it just, is. Just, just uh, paying homage to to the Japanese legends who are, are basically taking over Celtic. And I speak for myself, but I have no complaints about that at all. I'm more than happy for for them to come over and score some good goals for us. Absolutely. This is all I've got to say about our signings today. The satisfying noise. Perfect. <laughs> Cheers. Loving it. I've got a wee beer as well. So we what are you all drinking? Lads. Wee beer amaretti. I'm on. don't know if I need to pay them royalties now. I've mentioned them on stream or what. <laughs> Golden Goose. I thought it was appropriate considering thought... today. It's not an Asahi for me, but it's rather a Modelo. I do, however, have it in this glass that I definitely acquired legally and of course there's not going to be any lawyers coming to 67 Hail Hail's door at all. Indeed right, um, I feel people are tuning in not to hear about various kinds of alcohol but probably to hear about Celtic um, but if you are watching this you know you're no doubt off work or you're you're probably finishing work for the day and for the year, why not just sit back, pour yourself a wee beer or you know a tea or something like that and um, we're going to be here I think for the next hour guys, we're going to do some awards from 2021, we've even got a wee quiz lined up for both of you at the end which is probably going to go disastrously and um, but before all that we'll, we'll talk about the, the issues of the day guys and and obviously that that triple signing um were any of you were you expecting it this early john i was actually expecting it tomorrow um there was reports a few weeks ago that they were going to announce it all on the same day and it would probably be january 1st um but i think on hogney's better gives everyone the basis of a good night season the new year in a very constructive way and i don't know Ange postacoglu seems to have um, cast a spell over the Celtic board. You know, he's cast a spell over the support. But this board um, making three signings in one day, nine years worth of contracts plus an obligation to buy a guy in loan doesn't happen every day at Celtic. And, uh, you know, fair enough to them, I would say, and fair enough to Ange for convincing them that he is the man to, to bring in people to the club. Yeah, Andrew bringing up that point. Um, Celtic Football Club has found a biscuit tin, so here's a wee contribution from mine to you. Very, very appreciated. Um, Stevie, same question to you, but were you expecting it this early? I, I certainly was, was taken a bit by surprise. Yeah, I was shocked. I couldn't believe it. I mean, I enjoyed my big long lie today, and within two minutes, you, I checked were, my phone. You weren't even up? No, I know. I was uh, within two minutes um, of checking my phone. I saw you guys in the group. And I just saw loads of notifications and I thought maybe John had wound up some people on Twitter again. <laughs> but no, it turns out uh, Celtic were outstanding in their business. I, I, I was shocked. I really expected it to be announced maybe mid-January or something. I um, thought there'd be loads of red tape and everything, you know. But no, I mean, fair play to the club for doing that. It's, it's amazing. And I think the big thing about it is, Hamish, that... It shows that Ange has been back fully now. Um, he's been back to 100%, and he's now going to have a trust in the club and a trust in the powers that be at the club. And it now seems like Ange, as well as uh, Celtic, as well as the fans and everything, are all together in sync and we're moving forward. And it's just brilliant. We needed these guys in. We needed a, a real energy in the team because they've been running, I mean, they've been running on empty for the last few games. We've now got these energetic guys in and by all accounts I mean it's just going to be a real exciting time and I can't wait to see them against Hibs I really hope fans are back for it because everybody's so buzzing for it including myself If you compare it to a year ago guys and, and where Celtic were 12 months in, in the start of this year in January you know lurching from disaster to disaster we, we couldn't go a day without bad news 
Uh, in terms of the, the transfer window, we made one signing last January and it was John Joe Kenny, a player who even when he was signed, I don't think anyone realistically thought that he was going to be a long-term Celtic player. It was very much a, a stopgap signing. And you compare that to what we have now with genuine players being brought in with a view to the future. And I see you know, a future with all three of these signings. Um, and the difference, the difference from a year ago, John, is remarkable. And so much of it is down to Ange. Yeah, it's having a driven manager in place. I don't want to disparage last year's management too much because we've been down that road plenty. Yeah. Um, but I think Ange has made a difference and I feel like he's, like I said, I feel like he's just been a unifying force within the club. I think he's managed to convince people at Celtic that um, we're heading in the right direction. I don't think the club, you know, lays down this kind of money and, and this contract commitment without, you know, fully believing in Ange in the direction that we're going, which is another good sign. But, you know, Ange was talking about making signings earlier this week in the media. He was almost talking about in the past, sen- the past tense um, in terms of, you know, the, the business we've done, etc. So we know that these deals have been done or have been in place for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I think that's a credit to Ange for um, putting in the organisation. It's a credit to Michael Nicholson, who Ange is um, credited with a lot of hard work behind the scenes. You know, it's a good start to his tenure. It just it brings Celtic into the new year in a, in a positive fashion. Continues a bit of good feeling, as you say, refreshes the squad. More importantly, I think it just it optimises that starting a living. And these are Ange signings, and he's got a very specific plan in mind for them. For them, he obviously believes they they can fit into the way he plays. You know, he's not working with rough diamonds in the sense of players who were already at Celtic. Um, but you're right; they just the, the turnaround in the last twelve months has been extraordinary. Um, you know, this time last year we hadn't even suffered the Dubai debacle. So think about how deep in the doldrums we were or already with what what was to come as well. And to think of what's to come over the next few weeks and getting back to action and an exciting new start in eleven is is something special. If anything else, it tells us how long a year 2021 has been that Dubai was somehow this year, because that seems so long ago. Who are we most excited about, the three of them? Let's have a wee debate about that, because I feel as if you've got the main two, and then you've kind of got the third wheel, and without giving too much away, I did a couple of interviews earlier today with, with Sam Robson, the, the J-League expert who I spoke to about Hatate, and he's not quite as positive about Eddie Gucci as the other two, um, but if Edigucci is your preference, then let me know. But who, who would be your, your favourite out of the three? Who are you most looking forward to seeing, Stevie? It's Rio Hitati for me. Now, I did watch your interview um, with Sam as well, and I thought it was great. But I think a lot of Celtic fans have been sort of been getting their opinions from these experts and everything who are essentially try to just give themselves a profile and they're not fully uh, giving you all the details about these players. They're not passionate about it, it's more about themselves, whereas um, I've got a couple of guys uh, a couple of guys, a couple of mates even that run the So Rare Odyssey podcast and they get a lot of their information um, from, they watch hundreds of J-League football and they get a lot of information from Japanese media and the amount they've been going on about Rio Hitati for the last six months before we were even linked with them. You know, the guy is so versatile, he's athletic, he's like he's a monster when it comes to pressing. Wins a lot of interceptions, he wins the ball high up the pitch for us. He's a really good dribbler and he's always in control. Potentially, Rio Hitati is the bit that excites me so much about this, Hamish and John, is that Rio Hitati is the number eight potentially is a real fit for Ange Ball um, and that to me just is, is so exciting because we know how competent Ange is especially when moulding a creative footballer that's the sort of football that Ange likes to see he likes to see like high intensity pressing football and real Hitati is made for it and when I look at his stats you know he's uh, 30, 30 games, 30 starts um, for the team he was with but Lots of passes in the opposition half, guys, and he wins, you know, the majority of his duels as well. He's extremely tenacious, he's got incredible ball control. I honestly, um, out of the three of them, I think we needed a player in midfield that can just drive us, um, that can just, you know, it was just a real energetic presence for us. I don't think we're blessed with a lot of pace there, but Real Hitati is a player that can come in and can really uh, drive that midfield, and I'm really looking forward to seeing him. I think he's going to be fantastic for us. 
I think at the same time we have to realise though that we have to give these guys time. They're coming from a completely different culture into the petty world of Scottish football. It's not easy just to adapt. But Kyogo's been great. And I think obviously if these guys have got a right good attitude and they're professional, then they're under the right manager for it as well. So I've got high hopes for them. But out of the three of them, it's Hitati that I'm really looking forward to seeing. If you can hear me, I can talk about him for the next 10 minutes, but I know you guys have got stuff to say. But I'm just very passionate about speaking about this guy and I'm very excited to see him in the hoops I think he's going to be absolutely dynamite for us uh, it's, I've not got all that spiel that you just went on but it's Hitati for, for me as well I just think that's the kind of player I love to see a player who can link the play who can make those incisive passes um, I, I, and I think it's exactly what Celtic need in that team he's the guy who can find Kyogo making the runs the, the player that we've arguably not had since Ryan Christie left um, now I know Tom Rogic does it from time to time but I think Christie and, and Kyogo had a, a really impressive relationship for, you know, however long they were together, six weeks or so. And I think that Hatati could be the guy who will just, you know, give Kyogo the service he needs and, and give him it nice and early. Um, but it sounds like he's got a real engine as well, maybe like a, a David Turnbull with, with a bit more pace and a bit more um, stamina as well, perhaps. Um, but John's about to say my, doesn't he? Well, I'll just go for it because obviously I'm excited about Rio Hotate, but just to move on the discussion and talk a bit about Iriguchi as well. But Maeda is, you know, he's a player who's been doing the business in Japan much in the similar way that Kyogo was doing the business in the sense that he kind of moved from a more left wing position into the middle for Yokohama, um, scored 23 goals, won their golden boot in the J League. Um, and I think he can. Of all the three of them, I think he's the one who can hit the ground running, much in the way Kyogo did. Um, I think he's got that gallusness about him. I think he's, again, a player who can press from the front, which is, again, what we need in, in those areas, and that's that's the way Ange likes to play. I think he'll provide good cover on the left or through the middle, again, which is what we need. Um, so I'm, I am excited about him. I think another interesting factor about both Maeda and Iriguchi is that they've both had spells abroad before and it hasn't worked out. Now, Idiguchi made a very interesting comments, you know, on leaving Gamba Osaka, essentially saying that he's chosen to move abroad again because he still feels like he's got something to prove after, you know, failing you know, failing at Leeds, not doing particularly well out and loan in Spain and Germany. He had a tough time of it. Um, and I think having a hungry player with a point to prove is mm. ideal for working under Ange Postacoglu, who I think he can tap into that. Um, and and that's what you want from your players. He's still only twenty five. It's not like he's twenty nine and he's he's you know on a, on a last last chance saloon. I think he he sees this as a big opportunity working under Ange, who understands Japanese footballers, who understands how to get players to um, transfer to a different environment. Now you, you don't forget that Ange when he was working in Japan. You had a lot of Japanese players, obviously, but you had Brazilians, you had peoples of other nationalities. He knows how to get people to fit into the culture of football that he's currently performing in. Um, so I'm quite optimistic about that. And again, Maeda had a spell in Portugal that d- didn't quite work out. Um, there was a lot of pandemic-related re- reasons for that. Um, but I think with, you know, hopefully, Touchwood 2022 20, being better on that front, then he's ready to take his European dreams forward too. So I think there's positives about all three of them. Um, and I'm really excited about Hatati too. I think he is on the verge of improving and developing into a player that will be, a, you know, a future Japanese international. And um, I'd see no downside from any of these three signings. Um, you know, I think it's all upside, and I'm really excited about them fitting into the team. Um, they've all got a point to prove, as you say, which is crucial, and that goes for a lot of Ange's signings so far. When you look at them, you know, Jota, a lot to prove. Um, Joe Hart had a lot to prove. James McCarthy, arguably, um, arguably hasn't done it yet. But you know the vast majority of players have come in and really had something to prove. And I think that goes for for a couple of the players that we've signed as well. Um, you would love to to know what Kyogo is thinking right now. He must be absolutely buzzing. You know, thinking I've come across the world. It's going great for me. And now we're going to get you know three players who come from the same country as me, who I can. Let's face it, probably relate to more than people living in Scotland, uh, people I can speak in my, my native language to. And I, I just think it's it's going to be excellent. Um, 
and they all add something as well. Um, they're, they're all kind of badly needed. Um, it sounds like Maida's going to be more of a left winger, according to Sam. That That's where his main role is going to be. <laughs> uh, he can also play up front, but he's mainly going to be playing off the left. Not a great dribbler, by all accounts, but the kind of player who will run in behind and the kind of player who will get in the end of crosses and score a lot of goals at the back post, which is obviously something Ange really likes and we've seen already this season. Maida, eh, sorry, eh, Hatati has the, the potential to be probably, probably the most special out of the three, but may take a little bit more time to, to get up to speed. And Eddie Gucci um, sounds like he has, again, the real potential. There's a player in there somewhere. But he's not really found that form apparently over the, you know, the last couple of seasons since he returned back to Japan after his kind of trials in Europe. So it's going to be really interesting. Um, we got a wee one in there for, from Mazar Yusuf, big fan of the channel. Um, Mazar, out, out of the four Japanese players, who will be in our regular starting lineup? Does anyone want to take a stab at that? Good question, but I think I don't. I don't think Adeguchi. Ed, will be Willie he'll be a, a kind of squad player I would think unless he's unbelievable it, it depends I, I know I, I could see him you know starting plenty of matches you know you're looking like guys like Nier Beton are getting a lot of games just now you know that Han, Andrew's whole thing I think ultimately will be when he feels like he's got a squad in place is that he feels like he can rot- rotate through the squad because he's talked about the number of games they're playing he's talked about the injuries people are, are picking up because of the high intensity way Celtic play so I wouldn't be surprised if he gets plenty of games. In terms of a full strength, starting 11, then I think the front four will probably, or sorry, the front three will eventually be Maida, you know, Kyogo through the middle and probably Jota off the right. Um, the right? Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I agree with John. That's what I've got noted here as well. Because if, I mean, if you think, I think he will transfer better to the right-hand side than Maida would by all accounts, you know. Um, and then you would have a, a, a first choice Support and duo of Hatati and and Rogic perhaps, and then you would have McGregor behind them. I could see that that's that's the way it, it could work out. You know, just you know, off the back of a back of a fag packet here stuff. But um, that's definitely how I see it. You know, going forward. But we'll just need to wait and see how they perform. And immediately, players who aren't in your team: James Forrest, Leo Labada, David Turnbull, mm-hmm. Eddie Gucci. Mm-hmm. Um, so you've suddenly got options here, and I think that's what Celtic have done with, with these signings today, Stevie. No, I agree. I've always said as well, I mean, it's not a bad thing to have quality players like, you know, Forrest and Abada on the bench as well. If their feelings are hurt and they're like, on, oh, wait a minute, um, there's other guys coming in to replace me. Good. Then that's, mm-hmm. that'll, you know, give them a, a kick up the backside as well to actually try and displace them, the guys coming in to replace them for the team. So it's competitive. And that's what you want to see in the team for too long. How long this season have we saw the shambles on the bench and Ange hasn't been able to do anything? Like, you know, me and John had a discussion after the St Mirren game where John was, you know, saying there wasn't anything to bring off the bench and I was clutching the straws saying uh, Adam Montgomery should have maybe come on. But I think we both know, you know, that's that's where we are and that's that's the level where we're at now with these, without these players. Now that we've got guys in, it adds more depth and it's great options for the manager. So... I've said that time and time again, there's no day in that Celtic team who should just be a guaranteed starter. Like, you know, James Forrest, for as much as he has a club icon for us, he shouldn't just be a guaranteed starter because he's what he's done in the past. It's what he's doing in the now under Ange that counts. Um, it's not about what you've done six months ago um, under this new, new, new regime. It's about looking forward and it's about what you're doing now under the manager. And if Forrest, you know, is going to get in, hopefully that will uh, spur him on. To improve as well, I, I can only see positive uh, things with these signings, and I don't think anyone here is complaining. Question, that- question: Do you think they're going to be the only signings of January, or do you think I'm just going to try and bring in a defender, another winger, maybe? I don't know. I mean, <laughs> I probably could do with another defender if you know if we're honest. But was Julian mean- coming back? I saw that, but then you've got to think about that. It's a long lay off the injury for him, wasn't it? And he's not going to just slot in like right away for that Hibs game. He's going to need a while to get up to speed. But I still feel as well, I st- despite the criticisms and everything, and I know he's not been great the last few games, I still think, you know, you can't just like dismiss Carol Starfelt because Starfelt came in for a lot of criticism, from myself included, and he's really turned it around. And yes, okay, it wasn't brilliant in the final. 
and I know against St Johnston he was poor. But I think you can't, you can't just it can't just be boom bust all the time. You know it can't just be going for one extreme to the other. If you look at it, Starfell and CCV have worked together to form what is still to this day the best the um, defensive re- ever in best season. defensive record in the league. Exactly. So you know you just get rid of Starfell and CCV might not adapt well with Julian. You've got to realise that Starfell and CCV have built up an understanding. Starfelt gets a break, gets refreshed, comes into the Hibs game and hopefully carries on the form that we saw that he's no he's capable of and then, you know what, maybe we'll look at other defend other options and all that if the dodgy form continues. But I uh, hopefully um out of them all, I think, out of the other positions, I think maybe Andrew will be looking for a defender now. He's got the other sort of situations covered. Left back, maybe for for me is the, the one position I would still want to strengthen. Hatati can play there though, so no, apparently, apparently. Justice, he's... justice for Greg Taylor, as I'll say. I think he gets a bad rap, not just on this channel, but in the Celtic support in general. I think Greg Taylor's a better player than a lot of people give him credit for, and I think Ange, Ange Postecoglou rates him, and I think he'll be the first choice left back. And we've got Juranovic who can can fill in there if needed. You've got Ralston on the right hand side. You know, I, I'm not too panicky about our depth there, to, to be quite honest. Uh, the name Hannes Wolf has been mentioned. He's a player who can play uh, as a number ten, I think, off the left hand side as well. Do you think? Do you think we need another winger? If if you look at you know when fully fit, with the huge caveat when fully fit, Johnston, Jota, Abada, Maida, Forrest, uh, Dembele. Do, do we need someone else I mean, there? I don't want to. To do the old cliche, but it depends if a good enough player is there, uh, you know, available. I don't think we need to sign a, a winger for depth's sake, but I think if there's a winger of quality out there who can add again, like to the to this first team in this squad, then obviously, yeah, I, I think we could do with another one. Um, but they need to be good enough. I, I don't want to. I don't think. I don't think there's. We need an emergency sign in there, like we needed a John Joe Kenny last season, for example. Exactly. And the year before, or the year before that, Oliver Bark and and Tolyan, you know, and Laxalt in the summer of the year uh, last year, we were always kind of putting sticking plasters on. And to an extent, that's what the summer was. I mean, Cameron Carter Vickers, I would say, was you know a last gasp signing, and I'm so glad we got him. I feel like now, and just just kind of got Celtic where he wants to be, um, in in terms of you know the squad bringing those three players in. Maybe we'll get another one. Maybe. Jota or CCV permanently could be a nice wee surprise. If Celtic are looking for tweet ideas, maybe a wee double double signing of them sometime tomorrow would, would go down well with supporters. Um, but but that's one to watch as well. It's, it's exciting times, guys. The players are going to be back next week, I think. We're going to have you know images of, of the three new signings, training with the team at some stage. We're going to have interviews, I'm assuming, press conferences. It's... It's going to fly in between now and the 17th of January. I, w- I was quite worried that it was going to be a real drag. And if we're honest, up until today, this week has been a little bit of a drag um, with regards to, to news. There's been very little coming out of the club. But I think the next couple of weeks, once we get into the new year, are going to be exciting, guys. Um, will we move on to awards? Yeah, go for, for it. For, a, for the wonderful 2021, which actually didn't kick off until June. Um, when Ange came in, I think we'd all agree that that's when 2021 really got underway. Um, we're doing best player, best young player, best signing, best goal and best game. So let's just get right into it with uh, best player. That's what we've gone for, guys. Oh, Bit of a, um, a couple of interesting calls in there. Um, I've obviously gone with the correct answer of Kyogo Furuhashi, um, who for oh, me done. is just... what. We're go- we're going to have an argument here. But see see when we see when Kyogo was out the team, we didn't miss him as as nearly as much as we, we, as we missed Tom Rogic. He's he's been the most important no. player for us this season. Kyogo's brilliant. I love him. Jota's brilliant. I love him. But some we, respect we for Thomas, Kyogo please. Big time. I mean, our whole game plan under Ange went when Kyogo was there. We we struggled like mad when Kyogo wasn't there. And for me, he's just my, my favourite Celtic player in a long, long time. I love the guy. I think he just comes big in big moments for us. And even just away from what he does on the pitch when he's playing, he just adds so much to, to the club. Celtic Park 
I think I said this a few weeks ago, when Kyogo was injured, there was like a dark cloud over Celtic Park and you couldn't escape it. Even if you were going to games and we were winning, we were beating Motherwell, there was just a dark cloud over Celtic Park because the star man, Kyogo, wasn't there. And then the minute he came back for the cup final, everyone's mood changed. And the minute he came back for the Leverkusen Europa League game with McGregor, everyone's mood changed. And I... I, I I didn't really support Celtic when Larson was playing, certainly like as much as I do now. But I can't remember a player since then. I'm not about to make any major statement. I can't remember a player since then who had such an effect on the support. Whereas you know when he when he's fit, everything in, in the world's fine. Bayern Munich could be rocking up at Celtic Park and you'd fancy your chances with Kyogo in the team. When Kyogo's not in the team, you know. Aloe Athletic, well, that's a bad example because we play them in a few weeks, but <laughs> um, Brecon City, and you're you're getting a wee bit concerned. The, the guy, the guy is just a huge, huge figure, and it's been a long time since we've had a figure like that. So, so that's why I'm going with Kyogo. Stevie, remind us how good Jota is, please, because he's been out of the team for a wee while. Indeed, in the nine. Uh, Premier League game, games that he's played he scored four goals and he's weighed in with four assists as well he has weighed in with two assists in Europe and all in all he scored six goals for us at the club which is no bad going considering he's only been here a few months I feel Jota is such an exciting player to watch anytime he's on the ball you know you can go cut inside uh, you can go on the outside he can shoot he can dribble he knows when to pass the ball he just his decision making's fantastic I've said day in day out I remember Sound like Brendan Rodgers here, I'll never forget one, but I mean, I was with Hamish and you and outside Celtic, <laughs> outside Celtic Park, and we beat Ross County 3-0, and I remember I wasn't, I wasn't writing Jota off, of course, but I remember I was never fully impressed with the debut, I just felt, you know, this guy's okay to now, but let's judge him in the big games, let's judge him, you know, in the in the horrible wee away venues at Dens Park and see if he can, you know, when it comes to a tighter pitch, if he can enjoy all that as well. And he, sh- he has massively shot me up. It takes a lot to for me to credit somebody when they make me look like an idiot. But Jota has just been sublime for us. The assist for Kyogo's goal against Ferenc Faros was just world class. The finish first time in Leverku- um, against Bayer Leverkusen, magnificent. Anytime he's on the ball, He's just a player that, you know, there's a lot of Celtic players since I've been growing up that anytime they're on, they're on the ball, you just get really excited and you can't wait to see what they're doing next. So the way for Pierre, the John Collins, the Canio, Henrik, you know, even the well lone... Th- <laughs> very good. <laughs> and they've, even like Craig Bellamy, who was a lone player, was just like, he's, he's the closest I can think of, like a lone player that is just so exciting that made an instant impact, Craig Bellamy. But unlike Bellamy, I'm hoping that Jota will be signing with us permanently. I mean... I know that you know what football agents are like, you know, they're trying to get the best for their clients and he'll be saying to Jota, well, you could get this at Celtic, but look at what you could get elsewhere and everything. So I'm not naive. I know how this could play out, but I'm really hopeful that Jota has taken, you know, Celtic to his heart and it's the old romantic in me that hopefully goes that I just hope that he signs full time because it would be such a boost for us, it'd be a massive lift and ahead of the very difficult run we've got in January when we're back for the break, the thought of having these guys in what we've got today CCV in permanently and Jota in permanently man that everybody would be buzzing at that and we wouldn't be able to get the smiles off our faces and seeing Jota for more than you know, not just to the end of the season but if he was here for a few more years it'd be brilliant it would be, it would, it would just be amazing to see I just hope, Stevie, that you don't get your heart broken here because I think over the years, since I've known you, you've hated a lot of lone players that have come through Celtic, even yeah, popular have. ones who have done well. And you've, you're have you letting yourself get carried away with Jota here. And I'm all for it. This is how you should be feeling about him because the guy is magic. Um, and I just hope, again, that he stays at least for another season or something. I think it would be magic. Can you um, imagine Jota in the Champions League next year? Can you wonderful. just allow yourself to imagine that? He would light it up, wouldn't he? He would. Oh, he would. He would. He's made yeah. for. He's made for the big scene. I mean, he's made for the big occasion, and he has been outstanding to watch in the Europa League for us. I'm glad we got him in for those games. He's just. He's honestly just been a standout, and in the Champions League, I don't think he would freeze either. I think he would just relish that opportunity. So I would and. I'd love to see him in the Champions League for Celtic, but as John says, I won't get ahead of myself. But you know what, John, Hamish, you've known me for a long time, and 
I think since Andrews came in from day one, I've been really excited with these players, really excited with this manager. And I'm an old-fashioned football fan. You've got to let yourself get excited and get carried away sometimes. It's what football's all about, isn't it? I 100% agree with that. There's nothing wrong with a bit of emotion, with a bit of getting carried away, with a bit of hype. You know, it's all part of it. It's all part of it. If our hearts do get broken, that's all part of it too. You've, you've got to go with the ride in football. Nothing lasts forever, as they say. Um, and it's you've got to enjoy people while they're here. So I'm, I'm fully on board with your sentiments here. And I've worked out what you're doing, John. You're just playing up to the Aussie support, who are probably all sleeping at the moment um, by going for Tom Rogic. Well, <laughs> it's Happy New Year to the people in Australia, I think, already. Oh, yeah. um, I'm not going to sit here and talk about Tom Rogic for five minutes because I've done that on a lot of occasions, even this season. But, again, I would just go back to I do feel like he has at times been our most you know, important player, even when Kyo is in the team. Um, I think the fact that Rogic is now playing 90 minutes on a consistent basis, I think before we went off the break, he, he played 90 minutes in the, in the final, he played 90 minutes against uh, St Mirren, and then he played 90 minutes against St Johnston. It's just not the kind of thing that we've seen from Tom Rogic over the years, and I, I, I felt like he played you know, consistently well across across that period. You know, Even against St Mirren, the whole team were poor, um, but Rogic was still... You know, creating chances, trying to create opportunities, and don't think anyone else does it quite like him in our squad. And and he's the player I enjoy watching most at the moment. And they are still up. Um, Vander James Hum, they're saying three a.m. in Australia, making peanut butter crumpets and coffee. So your your uh, comments and Rogic have been heard by the Aussies. Um, right, next up, um, best young player. Um, hang on, I'll just get rid of that last comment. Uh, Find it. Right, best young player. We've gone for the following. Mm. Explain yourself, Stevie. How the hell can you have a best player being Jota and he's not the best young player? <laughs> well, you did give me these ca- this category to talk about, didn't you? And you we, said, we should say, you... sorry to interrupt, we should say that it's 22 yes. and under when Ange came to the club. All right. I just think with... Anthony Ralston, you know, I've said it time and time again on here and on Gigpod. If you said to me, you know, in the summer, we were absolutely, we were losing our minds at the fact that this guy got a contract. I mean, couldn't get a game at St. Johnson, Dundee United and loan. Featured last season against, I believe it was Livingston and a 0-0 draw. Absolutely draw. He put in one cross, but other than that, it was terrible. And it was, the team, the system they was in was disjointed, okay, but I just couldn't see a future for Anthony Ralston. In the summer, Celtic put out a tweet and they said, oh, there's a deal for uh, Anthony Ralston now. And everybody, and think Griffiths accompanied it a few days later. And everybody lost their minds, and rightly so. I mean, the club didn't have a vision. They didn't know what direction they were going. Ange was only just in the door, and it just felt... It's just more of the same. This is why this season, you know, I was, I was expecting Rangers again to run away with it, especially after that start in June. I'm like... I mean, there's, if we're going into the season with him as a starter, we're done. I mean, but this is going to be like a five-year plan for us to get out of this mess. And then in Denmark, Anthony Ralston in the 2-1 defeat against Midtjylland was actually one of our better players. And I remember saying, OK, I don't know if he has the answer, but mm. certainly he wasn't hiding. He was one of the few that could pass marks for that game. And then a few days later, he scored against Hearts. It was a wonderful goal. And I remember again thinking, right, okay, this must be a funny purple patch or it's a big wind up, but he, he can't keep this up. But he did. And, you know, the enthusiasm that he's shown, but not only, it's all right just to say that he'll run, run through a brick wall for you, no pun intended, but he'll, you know, he'll run through a brick wall for you and whatever. But you need to back that up with actual stats as well. But well, I've got the stats, and it's for him to have 29 games for us this season, five goals and five assists. And you think about the performances that he's put in, when everybody had written him off and everybody was groaning at the fact that he signed a contract, it got to the point halfway through the season, people were urging him to sign a new contract. And yeah. it's a testament not only to the fact that um, how much he turned around through just sheer hard work and ability alone, but it's a testament to the manager that we've got that has managed to turn that around for him as well. And he's one of the first players that bought in to Ange and Ange's style. And I think he exemplifies everything about that manager um, and about how that's why when these new guys coming in, 
for everybody saying, you know, Hatati, Maeda, and Adeguchi might not hit the ground running. We keep forgetting, or I keep forgetting, sorry, the manager's hand, and he knows right away how to get the best out of these players. And what he's managed to do with Anthony Ralston has been outstanding. What Ralston's contributed to this to Celtic so far has been incredible this season. And that is why I think, yeah, so far, he is the best young player for us. And if you want to slaughter me, go ahead, but I stand by it. And I will apologise and put my hands up for all the groaning I was doing because he deserves all the credit in the world for how he's performed with us. Yeah, I mean, he, he played like the first game of the season at home to Mitchell and I think I think we did the reaction that, that night, John, me, me from outside Celtic Park, and I think we both said that we actually felt quite sorry for Ralph and that he was been put in that situation because he just wasn't up to it. Um, and it had gone beyond the point where, you know, I think there was a lot of people you know, raging that night that Ralston was still in the Celtic team. It got beyond that point, I think, for us and for a lot of people. It was almost just like, you know, it's actually unfair in the guy to for him to be playing Champions League level and just looking so out of place. And basically since since that game, as, as Stevie says, um, you know, Mitchell and away, Hearts away, um, scores away to Hearts, scores at home to Dundee. And then he kind of reaches that point where you're thinking, right, this guy could be quite a good squad player. And I actually think over the last maybe couple of months before the break, he actually went to a new level. And I actually think he he, he showed a level, a consistent level, that, that he could be Celtic's right back. Um, and I absolutely love, absolutely love Josip Juranovic. I think he's absolutely class, one of the best fullbacks we've had in years. But I honestly don't think it's a shoe in that he's a right back going forward. I think Anthony Ralston can stand up in that fight and can say, you know, I've arguably been better than you this season. Um, and we're talking about, you know, Croatia's right back. I can't remember a player, you know, having this sort of recovery at Celtic. Um, I mean, Virgil van Dijk had a really bad start for six weeks and then turned out incredible. But I can't remember a player who, let's face it, was pretty poor, um, pretty average for, for, what, three, four years, three, four seasons couldn't get into the St. Johnson team, couldn't get into the Dundee United team, and is now, he's almost undroppable from the biggest and best team in the country. Before we move on, just want to note for the record that Hamish, yes, he has just compared Anthony Ralston to Virgil van Dijk. <laughs> just, for, just for everyone commenting below, um, just get stuck right into that, guys. Um, that'll, that'll make my the, my the start of my new year. It's a bit unfair, that. On Virgil van Dijk, isn't it? Compare <laughs> them to a player like Ralph Ralston, he knew as he was called earlier. Um, so, so, yeah, so we are, we are... Well, we should talk about who we are, Jota. Well, I suppose we've already kind of touched on him, yeah. John. Do you want to take Jota for a second? Just Jota for all the, the reasons that Stevie laid out, you know, for, for his the, the best player shout, and um, he's just a joy to watch. I, I think I had him in the young player side, because I still think there is improvement from, from him to come. And he still feels like a player who is developing. Um, but yeah, I, get, I, I can't really disagree with Stevie on Ralston either because when you think of like young player awards and young player stuff, you tend to kind of have a bias towards homegrown players. And I think there's no other player in the squad that everyone's been rooting for more this season than Anthony Ralston. So, um, so that was a good shout as well. Honourable mentions for Liel Abada, uh, David Turnbull... Stephen Welsh as well, Liam Scales, Adam Montgomery, who are all fit into this category. But I think it's fair to say that Ralston and um, Jota are probably a bit ahead of even Turnbull and Abada, although those players have had quite a big impact. Right, I, I said to, to the guys before this, take this seriously, lads. Take this seriously. <laughs> Best signing. Thanks, John. <laughs> players who aren't even played. You're going to have to explain yourself, mate. I just think... <laughs> Like I got, I was a bit carried away. Uh, Hamish asked me this question literally ten minutes after the news was announced, <laughs> um, so I got a bit, I got a bit carried away. If I'm going to be serious, my, my reasoning for it is, that I think this triple signing has, as we said at the start of the show, has the real capacity to, to really kickstart um, Celtic this season and bring us much closer towards competing for trophies at the end of the season. All three of them are going to make an impact to the squad and this team in general. Um, so a little bit of tongue in cheek there. Um, so apologies for that as for you two the best signing apart from the three that I've mentioned is undoubtedly Kyogo Furuhashi so I think saying Joe Hart is a bit of a, a nonsense if I have to say so myself so you you two will have to justify that one and all three of us will get pellers in the comments for not picking Kyogo 
Well, I, I, I'm safe from Pelters because I've already picked Kyogo as, as the best player, so I've covered myself there. Best signing for me, well, best signing for me is, is the player who's made the biggest impact at Celtic since coming in, you know, in terms Kyogo. of where Celtic were last season. Yeah, Kyogo's made quite a big impact, I must say. I don't want to shoot down my argument for 10 minutes ago. Um, but but from an attacking sense, it'd be Kyogo. But Joe Hart, for me, I couldn't let you know these nominations go or these awards go and, and not mention Joe Hart because that guy has been absolutely immense for Celtic. The stuff you see on the pitch, the saves he makes at, at key moments, and he has done that on numerous occasions this season in, in big games. I remember one against Ross County. We went we went on to win the game three 0 at Celtic Park, but the score was I think one 0 or even 0 0 and he made a brilliant, brilliant, you know, um, close range save, and he's made so many of them this season. The the leadership he's brought to that camp, and I think the experience he'll bring during the second part of the season is going to be huge. This is a guy who's won league titles in the past, and and let's face it, we've not got too many of them in the squad. McGregor Forrest. Um, you know Chris Uli and players like that, but I think Joe Hart is a proper commanding force, and I just I kind of thought, you know, a hundred odd caps for England. Is he going to come up to Scotland and, given the way his career's gone, and and think it's going to be perfect, and and you know think it'll be easy, he'll make a few saves, and then maybe dart down next season back to England. But this is a guy who I think is who absolutely loves playing for Celtic. And I sometimes think we do ourselves down at Celtic, you know, in comparison to English football. We sometimes say, oh, but he has to play at Ross County and St Mirren and all of that, whereas the Premier League down south is everything. I think playing for Celtic, being Celtic's goalkeeper is a, a huge, huge gig. You get to play European football, you get a challenge for trophies, you get days at Hamden a fortnight ago that the vast majority of clubs down south could, could you know, could only dream of. And I think Joe Hart understands that at this stage of his career. I think he's going to be Celtic's keeper for at least the next two and a half seasons, probably longer. And I just think he's he's going to be a massive addition. I, I feel a bit like Kyogo. I feel far more secure when I see that team and Joe Hart's in it. Stevie? Yeah, I agree with what you're saying. You know, you're just bringing up the has to go to St Mirren, has to go to Ross County. But here's the thing, there's a lot of pressure with that because he's expected to keep a clean sheet there. He's not expected to concede any goals. He's expected to be part of a winning team. So Joe Hart, I know um, when he was at Man City, he was expected to win most games, right? But not every game. So he had a turbulent sort of career from 2016 where we talked about it before in the show. He was getting slated publicly by Torino's president for being under par. Uh, he went to Burnley and I think he was the third choice goalie there. And it was such a, a running joke at Spurs where when he did get a game, sarcastically applauded and that. And I don't care what, sort of how, what you've done in the past and all that. Those five years couldn't have been easy. Yes, he's earning big money and everything. Aye, his life isn't terrible. But on the pitch and all that, he would have been bereft of confidence. And it wouldn't have been easy coming to Celtic where, as I've just said, that although he's been a Man City in the past, expected to win most games. He's having to win every game at Celtic. It's not. It's a case of, like, as Rizzo has said in Gig Pod, a draw can be a disaster. Look at the reaction against uh, St Mirren the other week as well. And he's had to come in and steady a defence that was it was all over the shop at the start of the season. He's had to come in and be vocal and be commanding, and he has done so. Um, and you're like, I think he's, he's been part of that defence, as I've said. It's all right to say CCV and Starfield have been a big reason as to why we've got that great defensive record. But I don't think that's achieved without Joe Hart. And it's just any time I look at the team sheet and I see Joe Hart there, there's a real sort of there's a real stability he's brought to that back line. Um, there's a real steadiness and I think the fans can trust him as well. Not only there's a couple of like you know, the the goal at Dundee conceded for example, that was that it's always going to happen with a goalkeeper, even Fraser Forst and Boric other clangers. But I think the big heart is heart is very consistent, he's very vocal, he's very commanding and what this team needed was a real leader from the back. What this defence needed was a real vocal presence and they've got it in Joe Hart and some of the saves that he's made for us has been oh, unbelievable this season. I mean, I think as well what was a key game was the, was it the Jablonets game? 3-0 one at home? 
or was it the AZ game? He made a double save and Celtic Park reacted like it was a goal. And ever since then, the amount of confidence he's got from it, you can tell he's not looked back. He's been really sort of appreciative of the support that we've given him. And as a result, Hamish made a good point. Um, I think it was after the final where he said that it was almost like Joe Hart's doing us a favour, but... Well, that's what sometimes it feels like. I think, you yeah. know, Celtic have played a big part in Joe Hart's career. Yeah. I think Joe Hart understands that. Um, and I think Joe Hart, oh, it's not going to be a case of he's only going to be here for maybe this season and next. I can see him being a long-term Celtic sign and, and v- a, been very crucial to any defenders and any players that come in just in that dressing room. He's a big character. He's a big leader. And it's what we need more of at the club. And not only that, Ange said for day one that he fully believed in him. And you can tell that the manager does because he's shown total faith in him. And look, we've got out it again under the manager. It's just, they want to play for him. They want to play for this club. And I think without Joe Hart this season, we'd be way more than six points behind. So that's why he's the best signing for me. Uh, the armchair expert putting forward a, a different point of view. Biggest signing is Ange. <laughs> Can't uh, disagree. That, that, yeah, I think that's kind of cheating slightly, but you certainly can't disagree. Um, next up, best goal. Finally, we all agree, hey. guys. Um, hey. I just want to get a couple of honourable mentions out there. First of all, Tom Rogic at Tanadice when he skinned half the team and scored. Uh, what was the other one? Callum McGregor against Meacheland away from home. The volley from like 30 yards from the corner is incredible. But I feel like you'll see a goal like that maybe every week if you if you look hard enough. I don't know if you see a goal like Kyogo's against Ferenc Varos anywhere mm. this season in terms of the way it was scored from one corner to the other corner. Incredible pass, incredible touch. I think it's pretty safe to say, hopefully I'm wrong, hopefully we manage an even better one, but I think that's going to be our goal of the season. It was in every sense of the world, world class. I mean, it was just extraordinary. From y- Yota's pass to, to Kyogo's control and finish, it just it's one of those ones that are just spine tingling, and mm. I can't you know I can't say enough. You know, the only one that comes close for me um, is Kyogo's uh, at hand in his second goal, or even his first goal, but his second goal, the one he lobs over the keeper in, in the final, and um, that was extraordinary as well because it's just one of those genius moments. Um, but the thing about the the Kyogo goal against Ferenc Varos is it's two genius moments, isn't it? It's a genius moment from Jota, it's a genius moment from Kyogo. Um, thrilling to watch, exactly the kind of thing we need to see in Europe more often in 2022. Um, and if we've got players like Kyogo making runs, players like Jota making those passes, then you know we'll be a match for, for many teams uh, on the continent. Stevie, briefly in that goal. I mean, it was voted, was it not voted the best goal of uh, the competition so far by, yeah. so there you go, even UEFA, who uh, would obviously never criticise us or our wonderful <laughs> fans, had to give us credit for that, so say no more, they love they love the goal, there you go, it must have been world class. A couple of honourable mentions, eh? Mazar in again, Ralston against County, of course, for the mm. limbs, was, was pretty good, and Paul McGinley, the goal in Germany, I assume he's talking about... Uh, Jota, the, yeah. the second goal against Leverkusen. The uh, the chip from Juranovic was was pretty decent as well. Yeah. I've um, got that second in my notes here. JJ's penalty, unbelievable. Second, a penalty. It was some, Mate, just some moment. Come on. against Bayer Leverkusen. It was unbelievable. I totally agree with that. I think Juranovic's penalty is right up there for me. The, the mental thing about every single award we've spoken about so far is that there's so many obvious ones that we have kind of had to miss out. Like, we've not even man- mentioned Callum McGregor for best player. You yeah. know, we've not mentioned others for best sign-in. Um, you know, there's loads of people, loads of goals, loads of stuff we can mention here, um, which, is a, which is a testament to how well the season is going. You know, a lot of detractors will say, you know, com- compared to last season, points total, all this nonsense, it's just uncomparable to last season. It's, you, you know... That's not a word that's incomparable to last season. Um, and, yeah, I'm just delighted with this. Um, this is a good wee review of the, the half season. It's making me excited to see Celtic again. Remember when we did the old grand old podcast and we did the Invincible Season Awards and there was so many choices. We had, like, we were literally about to invite each other out for a punch-up to do with the, the best player. There was so many awards. And then when you think of last season, like, the... It was just there was be nothing to talk about, and I always think you can you can sum a, a season up almost from from how these things go. So anyway, great I mean, stuff. We all, we all know last season never counted anyway, so we'll just move on. 
I uh, see that beer's going down well in, in Dundee. <laughs> um, let's, let's move on to, to best game. Uh, some interesting ones here, I think. Y- you mm-hmm. two are, are both sadly wrong. Um, I'm <laughs> correct again. The, the cup one. final is, is absolutely the game of the season. Come on. I've got justification for mine. I understand why you're saying that. It's obviously, it's been probably the defining moment of Andrew's reign so far. Wonderful occasion, just a really good game as well, especially in that second half. For me, the Betis game is about something deeper in that, um, you know, I know they didn't play a full strength team either, but I think knocking off a Liga team with literally um, our reserves was, was, you know, a sign to me that something quite special is happening at Celtic. You know, beyond the star players that we're talking about, beyond the big goals that we're talking about, every single player in this squad is absolutely dying to play for Ange and dying to play for Celtic. And the processes that must be in place at Lennox Town for these players to train on a consistent basis. The you know the players who haven't weren't playing for them to come into that game and and get a win. I know it didn't mean anything in the context of the group, but to get a win, round off that group of nine points play some pretty decent stuff against Betis who, who were good in that match themselves plus add to the fact it was just a really dramatic game like there are, a lot happened in that game both good and bad um, and uh, you know I love a game like that um, and if not for the Kyogo injury that hmm. you know ended up costing us a little bit but not not hugely um, you know the, that game would be you know legendary almost and um, yeah it was my it's probably my favourite the season you know other than the cup final that's fair enough. Uh, Stevie, Dundee United away. Yep, I went with the game at Tannadice because it's by far the most complete version of Ange Ball we have seen this season and I loved every moment of it from Rogic's goal, from McGregor's brilliant wee dink pass, the tumbles, exquisite finish and then the you know Liam Scales with his, with his goal as well. I just thought from 0 to 90 minutes we were in total control. The football was a joy to watch. We just, you know, we, we stamped all over Dundee United, we were right in their throat and we just never let them come at us at all. Potentially a tricky game, they had a lot to prove um, and for me it was the moment, you know, right away that it was watching all the games this season, it was the most dominant I have seen Celtic play. I was watching it, um, I wasn't at Tannadice for that game, I was watching it with my uh, gran, uh, granda and my uncle and honestly it was just such really, really happy the entire 90 minutes, just a total joy to watch and was that even applauding at certain moments of play in the second half? We were relentless and we just never gave up at all. We probably should have scored even more. But it was definitely, for me, the definitive version of Ange Ball this season and I hope to see it more in the second half of the season. It was brilliant. I think that was the first game without Jota as well, if I'm right in saying so. So so that was a really impressive mm-hmm. um, result, that. So so there you go. That's the, uh, the 2021 67 Hail Hail Awards, done and dusted, Mine, lads. Well, mines are all over the place, really, aren't they? I'm not going to lie, <laughs> but, you know, I stand, I stand by them. Right, well, we finish with a wee quiz then, lads. Um, we'll see how this goes. We'll try and rattle through it as quickly as possible. I'm not quite sure how it's going to work. Um, I would ask you both to maybe not look at comments coming in for people because we know what our wonderful, intelligent fans are like. They might be shouting out right or wrong answers at you. Um, but obviously you can play it at home as well. You can pick a side, um, Stevie or John, and, and see how you get on. So Stevie, you're up first for okay. two points. Who did Celtic play in their opening Premier Sports Cup fixture this season and what was the score? So one point for the team they played and a second point for the score. First Premier Sports game of the season. Was it no? Oh, that was was it not Hearts three two? Yep, that's two points. Yep. Um, and I should say, if you get it wrong, it will get passed over to the other person to steal the points. Uh, John, for two points, who did Celtic play in their opening Europa League fixture, including qualifiers, and what was the score? Europa League. Opening Europa League fixture, including qualifiers. The Europa League was AZ Alkmaar. Was it not? Is that your final answer? Yes. Stevie? What? Was it not Jablonets? And we won 4 2 away. Oh, so it was. <laughs> M- mate, oh. don't ask me. 
<laughs> no, I know it's a it's quiz. It's not a great start, I'll admit. <laughs> right, Stevie, you're up. Your phone will up, Stevie, after that. Okay. Um, for one point, Stevie, how many first team players did Celtic sign from Scottish clubs in 2021? So the whole of 2021. Oh. God, I think this might be. You're getting accused of reading the comments here, Stevie. I can't see any comments, <laughs> but um, I'm going to have to pass. I don't know off the top of my head. I'm done. I'm on my way. Pick a number. Shocking, isn't it? But two. John, passes over to you. How many sign ins from Scottish clubs did Celtic make in 2021? I don't think we made any. Correct. Point for John. He's he's closed the gap. David Turnbull, I think, was the last player we we signed from Mm -hmm. a Scottish club, and that was obviously uh, 2020. Right, John, for one point, who scored the first competitive goal of the Ange Postacoglu era? Ralph's then? Stevie? Wheel Abada? Abada. Against uh, Mitchelland. That was before the Hearts game. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Stevie, um, for one point, which summer signing played against Celtic in a league match earlier in his career? Five, four, three, two, one. Going to no, have to pass it over to John. Hey, repeat the question, Hamish, sorry. Um, which summer Celtic signing played against Celtic in a league match earlier in his career? Gonna have to press you. Don't know. You're gonna kick yourself, lads. James McCarthy. Oh, of course. Couple of games here and there. <laughs> this is awful. Uh, but you're back to you, John. You've not lost any ground there. Um, right, so which country did Celtic not play a competitive match in in 2021 out of Czech Republic, Norway, Denmark and Hungary? So Czech Republic, Norway, Denmark, Hungary, which one did we not play a match in? Czech Republic, Norway, Denmark, Hungary. Norway? Correct. Well done. Because mm-hmm. obviously we play there next year against uh, Bodo Glimp. So it's 5 2 to Stevie. Um, Stevie, for two points, Celtic faced two former players in UEFA competition in 2021. Who were they? So two former Celtic players we played in Europe this year. And you, you can get one point if you get one of them, or two if you get both. I know Jeremy Frimpong was one. Yep. I'm struggling to think of the other, if I'm honest. I can only think of Frimpong. Right, pass the other one over to John then. Eric Svietchenko. Correct, for for Mitchelland, of course. So it's 6-3 to Stevie. And John's got a chance to narrow the gap here with two points. Um, which two Celtic players have scored hat tricks for Celtic under Ange? David Turnbull and Abada. Kyogo. Oh. Jota. I know Turnbull's one. I've, I've forgotten the other. Right, we'll give you a one one point then, Stevie, for the other one. And um, Kyogo scored a hat trick against Dundee. John, I cannot believe you got you got David Turnbull and didn't get didn't get Kyogo. That's like the equivalent of beating eight men and then putting it over the bar. <laughs> right. Um, final question, and Stevie's got a seven four lead here, um, and it's three points for for the if you get it kind of relatively close. Um, so you can level it here, John. That'd be a nice fitting way to end the quiz. So it's a, a rough answer. How many competitive goals have Celtic scored under Ange this season? Oh, and I'll let, I'll let you go first, Stevie. And I'll give you a clue. We've played 36 matches. All right. I know we scored... Take, take your time if you want. No, no. I know we scored like 42 like goals. Um, we scored like, what was it? Uh, hold on. 
68. Right. John? Um, I'll go... I'll be a real bastard and go 67. <laughs> if you had the numbers around the, the other way, John, you'd be right, because it's 76 goals that we've scored um, in, in 36 matches, which is... is Pretty decent, I would say, given that a lot of games were in Europe and a lot of games were with injuries. Well done, Stevie. You're the well done. you're the winner. We'll give you a wee round Thank of you. applause. Well done, mate. Excellent. I'll never Hard forget lines, John. when Hamish Carton. <laughs> <laughs> I'm glad uh, that my knowledge of uh, Eric Sviatchenko and David Turnbull didn't let me down. At least uh, nobody was watching. There was only... 1200 people watching your your demise there john uh, we'll leave it there lads what 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 your what's your plans for the rest of the the year then the rest of the night well and my immediate plans is filling this up so i'll sort that out right away after this going round to my brother's Amish family gathering so quite excited about that very nice. I um, hope you both enjoy yourself. I hope everyone watching this really enjoys himself tonight as well. Um, yes, yeah, it's not been a great time overall to be a Celtic supporter, but I think 2021 has brought around some some positive stuff, um, certainly in the second half of the year. Um, the future is bright, and let's hope that 2022 is green and white. Happy New Year, everyone. <laughs>